to touch on the knee there. So, so <laughs> welcome everybody, and thank you very much for uh, coming for uh, Neuro Grand Rounds, uh, Neuro Rehab Grand Rounds. Today we have uh, Jessica Nebrowski. Uh, she earned her bachelor's degree in communication science and disorders in, from Pitt in 2009 and received her master's in speech and language pathology at Radford University in 2012. Uh, she's certified in vital STEM and is an LSVT lab clinician. Uh, her clinical practice specializes in the evaluation and treatment of patients with head and neck cancer, more specifically laryngectomy patients. Um, so without further ado, uh, I will turn it over to Jessica to talk about utilization of NMES and SEMG biofeedback in the treatment of swallowing disorders. All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for coming. Um, all right. So, like Steve said, uh, I'm at 8th Ave and Bethlehem an Outpatient. So today we're just going to be talking a lot about the treatment that I do with my swallowing patients, in particular using, uh, thank you, NMES and SEMG. More specifically, vital stem. So I'm, I'm trained in a vital stem, which is a brand name for NMES. Um, but just in general, you know, how NMES and SEMG can, can aid in the treatment of swallowing disorders. What do I point to? Oh, them? it should work. Okay, so some things we're going to touch on. Obviously, like I said, the NMES and SMG kind of overview of how that can uh, work in treatment of swallowing. We're going to talk about dysphagia management in general and some different approaches um, when it comes to rehab, uh, reviewing applications of the vital stem and plus units for those who are not familiar. Um, so after the course, you should really understand all about NMES and SEMG biofeedback. Um, please feel free to ask questions throughout or afterwards about this in particular or referring or anything like that. All right, so let's jump in. Some quick basics for those of you who are not speech therapists. Uh, swallowing basics. So dysphagia is the term we use for a swallowing disorder. So things that we can often see is choking, sensation of something stuck in your throat or the globus, um, the heartburn, issues of breathing associated with swallowing. Obviously, uh, any sort of inadequate nutrition hydration because you're not getting enough intake. Weight loss and aspiration pneumonia is the big one we want to prepare for. Uh, those at risk, we could see uh, TBIs, strokes, head and neck cancer, and any sort of degenerative diseases such as Parkinson's or ALS. So swallowing in general is a really complex process requiring uh, precise coordination of over 25 muscle pairs. So our brains control the whole process, and some of it's voluntary and some of it's involuntary. So in general, these interactions occur within brainstem, multiple cranial nerves, pharyngeal receptors, so it's sort of an overall body experience where any neurological issue, we can see a lot go wrong. Jumping into those voluntary and involuntary phases, if we broke them down, we say there's four stages of a swallow. So that picture on the right sort of shows you is the green button, the laser. Yeah, okay. So the, the tan, I wish they would have made a different fun color, but that's the bolus or the food. So it kind of breaks it up in the stages where the food is and what stage it's considered in. So the voluntary there is that oral prep or oral stage. Obviously, we can control how we chew and how much we put in and control it in our mouth with our tongue and uh, teeth and everything. Once the pharyngeal swallow is triggered, it becomes an involuntary reflex um, that we're crossing our fingers, hoping everything's working the right way to go down into the esophagus. But as we well know, that's not always the case with a lot of these patients with dysphagia. So sort of you know, important to break those up, especially for therapy, to know if it's something voluntarily we can coach them through or if it's something deeper that uh, is an involuntary issue. 
there's a blow up of that picture, just in case you really wanted to get in there and see those <laughs> markers. Um, so I just threw a slide in here about those cranial nerves that are involved, um, just again to facilitate how many things are involved with the dysphagia or can be involved with dysphagia. And the thing about this is when you get trained in vital stim and vital stim plus, they really talk about a lot of these nerves and knowing kind of the ins and outs because you might be triggering them. You might want to go right on a facial nerve to get, you know, a buccal oral sling response for, you know, oral motor issues. So I added that slide in there. If you're a speech therapist, I'm sure you're very familiar with all these nerves, but I won't quiz you on them. <laughs> okay, so later we're going to talk a lot about research when it comes to the treatment. So I threw this slide in here about the incidence of dysphagia when it comes to um, certain issues. A lot of evidence, like, so I kind of went with a broad percentage because some articles said, you know, 45, 65%, so then I thought, okay, 50, some said 80. Anywho, these were sort of the main numbers I got. So for a stroke, they said about 50% of strokes are going to have some level of dysphagia. Now, one thing to point out with that in particular statistic, um, later on in one of the uh, articles I read, it did say that most of that 50%, which they said was 50%, recovered within three weeks. So a lot of times it's more of that acute phase that you guys see, that immediate stuff that just kind of bounces back, thankfully, on its own. Um, but it is obviously something in the acute stage that us as speech therapists keep an eye on because it can be tricky, um, especially because another statistic I read was that 34% 34, 34 of all stroke-related deaths or because of aspiration pneumonia. Um, so again, there's some TBI um, incidences there, Alzheimer's, head and neck, Parkinson's. As we can see, a big area of uh, room for therapy, speech therapy. OK, so those complications. So now that we know about the swallow, obviously, we're jumping in when things can go wrong. So many of you know the term aspiration. Like I said, with the aspiration pneumonia. So this is anything, secretions, food, liquid, getting below the true vocal cords into the lungs, creating an infection, big issues going on there. Um, other complications that we can see is the dehydration or malnutrition. So obviously, if someone has trouble swallowing, they're not going to be, you know, drinking their water as much because it makes them cough. Or maybe they're on a thickened liquid and it tastes disgusting, so I'm not going to drink this, and then I get dehydrated. A lot of complications there. It leaves room for a lot of education. Um, pulmonary complications. So with swallowing, it's a big coordination of breathing um, and swallowing. So if that gets interrupted, uh, that's where the pulmonary comes in, uh, whether it's infection or just shortness of breath. Um, and then uh, quality of life. So obviously in the uh, acute stage, you know, we're not seeing a lot of people that are, you know, you, you get the restrictions. But for me as an outpatient, you know, if a patient's on a thickened liquid, they might feel a little embarrassed at a restaurant to, you know, bring their thickener and mix it at the table. Or they, they restrain themselves from being in those public settings because they don't want to cough their head off, you know, at a party. So they just <coughs> So there's definitely a lot of psychological components and social things that can complicate these issues. Okay, so dysphagia therapy. So we're going to talk a lot about dysphagia therapy in general and then how we're adding in the NMES and SCMG that, you know, that we're going to be talking about today. So just dysphagia therapy in general. If we look at it in two big ways, rehabilitative and compensatory. So rehabilitative. So we're trying to restore the normal swallowing function, doing exercises to strengthen whatever may be weakened, teach them how to coordinate better, um, just improving overall functions to compensate for whatever loss happened to give them a dysphagia. And then we're going to uh, compensate for things. So modifying their diet, any sort of uh, you know, maneuvers or anything to get the food to go down in the safest way. Obviously, if you are in this field, you know that the best approach and best practice is to combine both of these things. We're going to try to make their life easy by giving them compensatory strategies, but we do want to try to improve function as best as we can. 
by doing a lot of strengthening exercises as well. So for the compensatory route treatment will include many things. So the first thing is the diet change. So we can change the texture by pureeing, adding gravies, chopping things up, lovely pictures there. Um, and then the thick and liquid, everyone's favorite thing is the patient, but the safest quick fix um, to keep them on the safest and least restrictive diet is to thicken their liquids. Another thing on there that we could change is a taste or a temperature for sensory. So sometimes we see patients have immediate cough response that's really cold. You know, so maybe we just give them room temperature water and all of a sudden it's not so much of a sensory shock to them. So playing around with things like that are just things on our end for treatment we can do. Uh, postural and position techniques. So these are other things for dysphagia therapy we do. The chin tuck is a, is a good one to help you know, get the food to go down. A chin up posture would be used if possibly the patient had a hard time transferring the bolus you know, to the back of the throat, so it would be something to kind of give them more movement using gravity. Um, head rotation, so either, either turning the head to the right or the left, kind of depending on if there's a weaker side on one side. Um, and a lot of these things are played around with in smaller studies, which is great because you can really tell which one does the best job. And then a head, head tilt is more of the ear to the shoulder. Um, again, anything that kind of helps the would go down and play around with. Um, all right, so maneuvers is another treatment technique. So this includes an effortful swallow, which is a hard swallow, a Mendelssohn, a superglottic swallow, and a super superglottic swallow. So for those of you that don't know, maneuvers are specific strategies that us as clinicians or SLPs use to change the timing or the strength of particular movements of swallowing. So some maneuvers require following multi-step directions. May not be appropriate for all patients, especially if they have any cognitive problems. Um, but they are something that can be used in treatment. In the meantime, while everything hopefully gets stronger to to help keep the food go, have the food go down right away. Okay, treatment exercises. So if we're looking at that rehabilitative strengthening exercise route. We can do laryngeal elevation exercises, which is like that Mendelssohn maneuver on the previous slide, all about lifting and elevating the larynx, kind of an isometric hold to keep, to strengthen the muscles. Um, a masako or a tongue hold is that lovely picture of that guy sticking his tongue out and biting it and swallowing. Um, so this is something done without food or liquid in the mouth, but sort of a base of tongue exercise. Um, a shakir, I call them shakir, some people call them shakers, uh, is essentially a sit-up for your throat muscles. So you have a patient laying in supine, lifting their head towards their toes, um, either a repetitive lift or a lift and hold, again, for increased strengthening of that area. And then lingual uh, isometric or resistance exercises, um, if we're looking at any sort of weakness in their tongue, we'll, we'll look at strengthening that as well. Um, so this, uh, we also can do pacing and feeding strategies. So this is just something we can modify as well, whether it's bolus size, giving them smaller amounts or a larger amount if they need more weight on their tongue to feel it, um, helping them with rate, things like that. That's a picture of my son eating a big pancake. <laughs> pancake. Um, mostly just to get the picture of because I made a Mickey Mouse. Then I didn't let him do it. <laughs> I was really proud of that. <laughs> She's um, probably yes. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, but again, taking into account, you know, the cognitive deficit. So we don't always have the perfect patient who can we can yeah. tell them to slow down and they're going to slow down. So keeping that in mind um, during your treatment strategies. Okay, so biofeedback. So this is a treatment technique we can use in dysphagia that we're going to talk a little bit more about today that incorporates an ability to sense a change um, and have something visual to provide the patient with to know what that change looks like and feels like. Again, you want to take cognitive skills into account here if they're not able to follow directions or volitionally follow 
no, be able to do a hard swallow. This isn't for them. Um, but this is that chart on the right. It is this kind of an example of what an EMG for a Mendelssohn would look like. So we'll look a little bit later at the vital sim plus unit that I have, which is like a little Game Boy. So you have them at rest, and then you say, okay, swallow. So this, they're going to swallow, and then you hold, 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 and then they can relax. So you kind of, I like to draw it on a piece of paper, and I say, I want your swallow to look like this box, and then relax, and then do it again. So then being able to see that and have a goal to look at that is a great way to teach a Mendelssohn. It's a great way to know they're doing it right, because it's, you know, you know, as speech therapists, you know, there's only so much we can see and feel to know if they're truly putting the effort in that we want them to. Now, if I was doing this with an effortful swallow, it'd be more like peaks. And I'd probably set a baseline and you have to hit this line and that's where your effortful swallow is and it'd just be a big peak and then a rest and then a big peak. But that's the cool thing about, about feedback. And then electrical stimulation is another treatment technique. Um, so this is speech and swallowing disorders using electrical current to stimulate nerves um, for the muscles. So this is intended to strengthen muscles uh, in general. I mean, NMES is used in all areas of therapy. So obviously today we're talking about the muscles of the larynx to get that moving, you know, the high larynx elevation or whatever muscles need to move to get the swallow back to where it needs to be. Okay, so NMES and biofeedback, so that's me, clearly. Um, so that is my Vital Sim Plus unit with um, a head and a cancer patient that I have. So this would be what a session of mine would look like if we were doing the biofeedback. So he'd be looking at it, focusing on that, taking drinks, trying to get whatever we're working on. I think effort was swallows and do is what we were doing. Um, so how do you know your patient would benefit from either NMES and or SEMG feedback because definitely they can be combined or two separate things. So the first thing we always want to refer for a video, I mean that's pretty standard when it comes to dissage therapy in general because I want to know what's wrong, why, what am I trying to target, is exercise even indicated, is it it's going to help at all. Um, and it's, the next thing I'd look at is if there's any contraindications to NMES um, and if there's not, then jump right in and see if it's going to help us. So the four W's. So this was something I took out of my vital stim training that I took um, that I thought was a kind of a good breakdown of knowing when to refer a patient to use NMES when we think it's appropriate. So like I said, you're going to view the swallow study and identify what the signs and symptoms are. Find out what is happening. So the pathology, so what made, you know, why do they have a dysphagia? Um, dysfunction, so what functional movements affect it? Is it a decreased hyalurangeal elevation or, you know, pharyngeal constriction, knowing exactly what the, what the problem is? And then the impairment, you know, is it a muscle weakness? Is everything really stiff and fibrotic or is it just a coordination issue? So knowing that, then knowing what muscles might be involved, why it's happening, um, and then where do you start? You know, do you jump right into diet modifications and compensatory strategies, most likely, for the safest way to go, um, and then jump in there with e -STEM for your treatment, part of it to hopefully get rid of any sort of diet modification that you needed to keep that patient safe. But sort of the breakdown we think about when we get these dysphagia patients. So when it comes to the precautions and contraindications with the NMES, so not SEMG. So SEMG doesn't require any stimulation. It's just electrodes and then they measure. So there's no like stimulation. So this is just for like vital stim, stim therapy. Um, so obviously we're going anterior neck, overcrowded sinus, bad, overinfection, bad, pretty obvious. Um, everything else really that's listed is a precaution. So dementia is on there just because of feedback reasons. You know, we always have patients who, you know, we just, we want to know, it takes, it's a lot of back and forth when it comes to vital stim because I don't know what it's feeling like on them and I need them to sort of give me the, 
yes, no, are you getting the motor feedback, is it just sensory? So there's definitely a level of cognition that we want to take into consideration. Doesn't mean we can't. Um, same thing with any sort of implants, pacemakers, DVSs, defibrillators. Just keeping an eye on it. I mean, we're increasing blood flow to a muscle. So if you have any, if there's any signs of, you know, hypertension or anything, you just keep an eye on it. Tell the patient. I have never, never had an issue with this, but. Definitely something to mark, you know, in your eval or treatment notes, just to cover your butt that it's listed as a precaution. One thing that, um, oh, on there too, it says the only problematic issue with some of the research that they did was just skin irritation. Whether it was just like the stickers or the electrodes themselves, that was the biggest um, issue that they, that patients had reported on skin irritation. So I didn't put it on this slide, but I did want to talk about it. So neoplasm used to be a contraindication. If they had cancer, don't put this on. So when I got trained in Vital Stim Plus, so I was trained in Vital Stim when I first started with this company, 2013. And then Vital Stim Plus came about about a year ago when I got trained. And a lot of new things and research were coming up. And I remember I, this was like a big question I wanted to ask because head and neck cancer comes through my door a lot. And I really, I really want good outcomes for these patients. So I wanted to use Vital Stim. So according to recent research, Vital Stim, or yeah, Vital Stim on head and neck cancer is now a precaution, not a contraindication. So they did a study in 2011. Um, injecting like two squamous cell cancer into mice. So it made a tumor and then putting stimulation on that tumor and seeing if it made it grow. And it didn't. So that was the first study that where they were like, okay, so let's start this on human trials. So currently there's some you know research that they're putting it on active head and neck cancer patients to prevent further issues from happening and to keep the tissue viable and there's been no reports of, um, you know, increasing any or metastasis or anything like that, which I think is huge. Uh, so currently in my practice and with the ENTs and radio oncologists in the St. Luke's network, I am working on getting head and neck cancer patients in my door as soon as they get diagnosed to start to massage the therapy in general, just for education, because they're going to lose their swallowing problem, swallowing ability. But then if they're willing um, to come for vital stim, some of them are, and it's really helping them through the process. Even though they're going through radiation every day, they're also coming to me. Um, and as long as they're not having any open wounds or issues at that area, um, we're using it. So it's it's really exciting stuff because uh, they're trying to go, they're leaning a lot more towards um, not putting peg tubes in these head and neck guys right away. Um, that was sort of the standard, but the docs we're working with are trying not to do that. So that's why I'm on board to keep these patients um, with their PO as much as possible. So, sidebar. Um, okay, so more about NMES. So uh, uh, we were talking about stimulating muscle contraction. It's a low frequency pulse current contraction expands the muscles to help rebuild function um, from the brain stem reflex center, improve the circulation like I was talking about, and preventing any muscle atrophy. Um, so like I said, the vital stem is the brand name, so I kind of intermittently call it NMES vital stem. Um, but yeah, so that's a patient of Maria <laughs> at 8th Avenue using vital stem, just traditional. Um, with a, a therapist or with a, a patient. Um, so tip, so in our sessions, we're putting vital stim on them, having them eat a meal, coaching them just like we normally would with traditional dysphagia, you know, slow down, or that was a really big bite, or make sure you swallow hard. But they're getting that stimulation for the 60 minutes of their treatment as well. So just bumping up, uh, hopefully trying to decrease the amount of treatment sessions they need if we can bump up their or weakened muscles. So about vital stim in general, so it was cleared to market by the FDA in 2002. 
uh, introduced the USA, I believe, in 2003. Um, but this device itself, so this is the OG or original vital stim unit that most of us have. Um, it's a dual channel electrotherapy system, so it's got the two electrodes compared to, I'll show you the plus has four. Um, so it's designed for areas of the throat to promote swallowing. But I don't know if any of you, if you are vital stim certified, ever use it on the face, but it can also be used um, <clears throat> on the face as well. Um, and though you have to be certified um, to administer a vital stim. Um, so this <clears throat> might be a little repetitive, but I took it out of a, the vital stim manual again, and it's just talking about um, before you start vital stim, it's really important that you get that swallow study or fees, whatever assessment tool you have to determine the nature of dysphagia, and then the therapist can kind of plan their, their therapy through there. So I kind of thought, I, I like this chart, um, you know, so looking at the pathology first, so the disease, their status with CVA, their symptoms, excuse me, they're reporting the coughing, feeling that globus or the lump in their throat. The therapist is seeing penetration, aspiration, obviously on a video, and why. So the dysfunction is, there was decreased hyaluronic elevation and then UAS dysfunction. So all of those things, it's like a puzzle. You kind of have to figure out all of what all those things mean and then that leads to a weakness in superhighway musculature and then stiffness in the cricopharyngeus which is why the UEF is not opening. So when that happens so wow that's a lot sorry when, the, when, all, when you kind of have all those answers this is the placement uh, go to when it comes to vital stim itself. So vital stim, yes, is those two electrodes, but you can put them in certain ways to target different muscles. So for those of you that aren't familiar, this is just something that's a really great tool. You know, so if you're looking to really target hyaluronic excursion because you're seeing that obviously in the penetration and decreased UES, then I 2B, 1, or 3A would all target that. So I would look and maybe so maybe I try to be for a few sessions, see what patients reporting, how it tolerate, you know, they tolerate it. Um, one, I don't know if I've ever used that because I've never seen that long of a neck. Um, to be able to put the electrode with staying in the muscular and the thyroid cartilage and all that. Um, but 3A uh, is a pretty common one. So that that fits and that fits. So again, you're not glued to one or the other, but it's just a a nice guideline, you know, so sometimes maybe I'm working with somebody for a month and, or you know, maybe let's say six weeks, because I usually don't refer. So I have a swallow study, let's do 2B, two times a week, six weeks, things are going okay, maybe I send up for another swallow study, and eh, minimal change. I feel like they can get better, let's, let's switch it up. So maybe I'm going to try a whole new placement or switch up the game or something change, it has to change on my end. So I'm not seeing that, that fast of results. Now, unfortunately, in outpatient therapy, two times a week is just pretty standard. Um, you know, with our availability and patient's availability to get to us. You know, vital stim is meant to be on five days a week. And that's just not plausible for outpatient. And inpatient, that'd be fantastic. Um, but if it's a if I can convince them to come three times a week and I have an opening, I will, but I don't, three times a week is like the most you ever see me see a patient for vital stem. So with that being said, we might not see those results in those six weeks. You know, we're going to have to wait a little bit longer and really kind of delve into it. So there's a lot of things that take into account when it comes to that, you know, insurance and availability and all that messy stuff we deal with in our patients. But, um, okay, so backing up to this one, I wanted to show you the difference between the Vital Stim and the Vital Stim Plus. Oh, so exciting things. So has anyone seen the Vital Stim Plus or worked with it? Yeah, well, Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So Vital Stim Plus requires additional training. Um, but you have to know how about it. <laughs> of course, more money. <laughs> well, the cool thing is, so Vital Stim, you have to go, right? It's two-day course. You have to be there, da-da-da. 
Um, Vitalsim Plus, you can do it from the comfort of your own home, mm -hmm. and I believe it's only well, one day, two days. I think it's only one, one day. day. It's one day, because yeah. I did yeah. it over my maternity leave. Can I say it's two? But obviously you need one before you get the other, but um, yeah. but yeah, it is nice that you don't have to go and it's yeah, done at home. But it's also one of those things that it's live. So when you get trains, he's like, there are four key words, and if you miss them, you will not pass. So you're like taking the class and he's like, the key word is Safe. <laughs> right. So at the end, you have to know all four few words to show that you listen. <laughs> anyway, the regular by the STEM course is really good, though. That's oh my god. I feel like oh yeah. It was better than my right? It was better than like my small and classic. Yeah. Oh, I feel like I learned so much. Absolutely. And they do go over some dysphagia basics and stuff with Vital Sim Plus, but yeah. that one was it's more yeah, so like cool. how to use the machine, how to use right? The machine. Right. Definitely. That's a very cool one. Yeah. Yeah. Gina, what one? I think okay. Amy did a lot of practice <laughs> following that course because it's still like, oh, okay, how do you set this thing? And there's a lot of stuff going on. Right, there. there's so much that Vital Sim Plus does that I probably don't know. Or I don't use. There's a lot. But it also does just traditional Vital Sim. Hmm. So, um, yeah, so, okay, so it's got four channels. You can have two on the throat, two on the face, uh, which we've done. Looks really crazy. Um, but if they have dysphagia and Know, or oral and pharyngeal dysphagia, you can nip it all in the bud. The patient's willing. And each uh, channel or each actual sticker can be a different number or a different milliamp. Like it's like with traditional, well, traditional vital stem, each channel does have its own number. So I guess that's not really super different. But anyway. um, so with vital stem and MES treatment, so one of the things they highlighted is it's BMS treatment, which is sort of a vital stem term, uh, variable muscle stimulation. So the cool thing about this one is that you can adjust the parameters. So with vital stem, the phase duration and frequency are already set. It's like 80 hertz and 700 phase. I probably should have write it down. But anywho, it's, it's standard. What it feels like is what it feels like. But on the vital stem plus, you can set it so it's more comfortable, <clears throat> essentially. So you can work and customize um, something that feels better for the patient if they're super sensitive and it's still still giving the, the simulation treatment. So uh, definitely a good feature. Uh, same thing, max is out of 25 milliamps. The additions that it has is the SCMG treatment, <clears throat> which is that biofeedback we talked about, SCMG and triggered stim. We'll talk more about that, but they can see it. As soon as they do a Mendelssohn, I can hit get STEM while they're doing a Mendelssohn. Um, you can save data. It's got like a Bluetooth in it. So after a session, uh, you can save the summary of all the information. Uh, there are videos on there and an anatomical library. I've never use them. <laughs> <laughs> they're on there, and it's a feature. But I feel like the screen is too small that I feel like I'd rather show my handouts and educational materials, but, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll talk about that. Okay, so I found some videos on YouTube of the actual Vital Sim Plus in action. So you guys can really see what it's all about. But I mean, if I brought it, it'd be way too small. Remember York from your training. This is York.
Pretty complicated, right? <laughs> a lot of yeah, different. Yeah. I feel you on that. But pretty cool. So if you have the time with your patient and feel like they would benefit from it. Now, I typically don't use that many channels with that. I mean, I can see, but I, I, uh, I like to set it more. So when we're talking about VMS, I like to play around more with the phase duration and the contraction um, to get more of a comfort level. Um, as far as timing, that swallow could be a total of six seconds or three seconds in the mouth and just like, that's a lot. <laughs> but it's cool. Okay, this one is just gonna, I'll show you more of that biofeedback stuff. This one I use a lot. Okay, so I'm going to pause this for a second. So they don't really talk about it, but so like I said, with SEMG, the biofeedback, there's no stem involved. So all that you need is an electrode that's sort of super highway-ish area. It looks like he has it in a long way. I sometimes do the other way. Um, and then you have um, what the heck is that called? another sticker that doesn't provide <laughs> It's like a grounder um, that you have to put somewhere. So. When we did the training, we put it on our hand. It just needs to be somewhere on your body, and it just, like I said, grounds. Um, a lot of times, Marie and I just kind of put it behind the neck, kind of like on the trap, because um, on the hand, I feel like it gets in the way when you're eating. Um, but so that's measuring. If you're doing like a heart swallow, that's like the best placement to measure 
the movement of the swallow and then you see it. So another thing to note is when you use this part, you have to like unplug everything in the room and put your cell phone in a different room. <laughs> a, lot wrong. a lot can go wrong. It's a lot of Hold on, unplug everything. Unplug <laughs> this is kind of its baseline. Just normal swallow, find a baseline. In this trace view, you can kind of see it. So you're having them swallow, a normal swallow, and what you're getting is this line here. So then what you're looking for is you need to surpass that line, go over it, you need to hard swallow, you need to mendels it. So, and the way this works is every session that you do this, you always have to get a new baseline because it's always going to be different depending on where the sticker is and all of that stuff. So you always have to, it's not like you can get at 80 hertz or whatever and then just always keep it there. So. Now he's got more electrodes on him. He's got one here and then two. We're going to put them in with the. I see that. This grounder is like right there. That's like so in the way. Really good. Them and biofeedback. They have to be really cognitively aware. To be able to handle. But patients love it when they are cognitively aware and can do it because it is. Really this like countdown so they're relaxing so they're not getting any stimulation so it's counting down from I don't know 10 or whatever they send it to so he's just staying at a baseline staying at a baseline and as soon as it hits one he has to swallow he has to hit that target for the stim to even kick in and then he gets the stim for whatever amount of seconds she set it up um, but that's again another neat feature about this trigger stimulated biofeedback because it's only triggered when they hit their target. So they really have to work for it, work for the sim. You know. um, questions about that. 
Um, okay, so when it comes to stim in general, um, we're looking for motor feedback. So when you have a stim unit on you, uh, vital stim, you're going to first feel the tingling, eventually a vibration, a warm glowing, never heard anyone say that, but <laughs> a warm <laughs> glowing. Yeah. Um, but what we're looking for is the squeeze, hold, pulling. So uh, again, this is why you really need that feedback from a patient, because you, you want to get that motor control. That's how you're going to get contraction of the muscle. Um, once you hit that number, so in the way I practice, so I, I, re, I try and get to that initially. It depends on the patient. Sometimes they need a little bit of a warm up to get there. So if I get to, you know, I'm at a six and they're getting that pulling, start my treatment, do the eating, okay. Ten minutes later, maybe, like, how's it feeling? Are you still feeling a pull, a oh, squeeze? I'm like, well, oh, you can turn it up a little bit. I could use a little more. So I usually turn mine up throughout the whole hour and kind of have a minimum and a maximum threshold just to kind of get them as high as they can for best contact. Now, there's not a key number that they need to get to. Sometimes if you go too high, it's not going to let them swallow at all. So it's not like more is better. But you know, you want to challenge a patient because sometimes they don't know, you know what it should be feeling like and how much they can take until they try it kind of thing. OK. So now that you've seen the SEMG, lovely videos, um, they, the surface electromyogram, so it's using the surface electrodes to, to see that change and using a visual signal. So biofeedback can be used, use any signal, auditory, what have you. But we're talking about Vitosin Plus unit today, because that's what I know, and that's what I have, and it is a visual signal. But SEMG in general is an objective tool for assessment, which, again, is a really great tool to have. We even put this on patients on evaluation to get some either data from them or educate them on, I want you to do some mental sins and effortful. This is what it feels like. This is what it looks like. So we put them on an evaluation uh, so they know on day one what it looks like or what it feels, what it's supposed to feel like. Because as many of you speech therapists know, it's really hard to explain sometimes what a mental sin should be and what it feels like. So um, the feedback is really Okay, so we're re-educating muscle movements. So we're dealing with patients with these impaired motor and sensory problems. So we need, so we're using objective feedback about their movement. So the ways we can uh, use this feedback. So like I said, on evaluation, so we can document some objective data about their muscle recruitment. So with that being said, so sometimes if I get a head and neck cancer patient, sometimes they're hyper, like I need to use it to tell them to like relax. You know, they, I have them on the EMG and it's just like so, it's in flex and they need to, I'm almost trying to get them to down train, which is on there, um, reducing muscle hyperactivity. So that's another great way to use this device to, sh you know, for that feedback, be like, Let's try and get you to go down. That's what it feels like. That's what it should feel like. Don't always feel in this tense, hyperactive manner with your muscles. Um, up training is when we're hitting, trying to get a muscle to really facilitate and uh, strengthen, and then any sort of coordination. So it could, you know, for obviously counting down five, four, three, two, one, swallow. I mean, that's that's coordination, which we always know isn't always the easiest for our patients. Okay, so the biofeedback feature, we're revealing some of these physiological events um, and using these signals uh, to teach them how to manipulate uh, involuntary or unfelt events um, using the biofeedback. So the rationale is thus that if a patient sees his muscle activity rather than just feeling muscles more fiercely, then they can contract muscles faster. So a lot of that neuroplasticity sort of ideal behind the biofeedback especially. So the power of biofeedback, neuroplasticity, I just said that. The brain is capable of reorganizing itself. So repetition, sensory stimulation, and then movement feedback 
movement specific feedback. Um, okay, I feel like I'm getting close to two o'clock already. I, okay. Da da da. SMG. We already talked about that. I just want to get to the research really quick and then we'll be done. Oh. Normal swell, then the sin, we kind of looked at that, that other slide. Pretty cool. Okay. All right, so what does all this mean? How are we going to use it in practice? And does it even work? And then yes, in general, and biofeedback. So I have a bunch of articles, kind of broke them up, gave you the like key information I got from it, and how uh, we can continue with evidence based practice treatment. So with strokes, the study listed below that Park 2011 found that an effortful swallow combined with NMES as a form of resistant training increased the extent of laryngeal excursion in post-stroke patients with this audit. Thumbs up for NMES. Early application of NMES combined with traditional dysphagia therapy showed a positive effect in acute and subacute acute strokes with dysphagia. That one I really liked and I think I have a slide from that article. So this is all about acute phase. So this is uh, as early as you can go, putting the NMES on um, with your traditional therapy. So the graph, the traditional therapy, and then NMES and traditional therapy. Gotta love that. So that's using the FOIS, so uh, functional outcome, functional oral intake scale um, for outcome measures. So, about 40% of patients could return to pre-stroke oral feeding pattern three months after. So continuing with stroke, some other studies. So one study showed the risk of pulmonary infection was significantly decreased when general dysphagia therapy was combined with NMES versus like a traditional dysphagia therapy control group. Another one was vital stim therapy coupled with us with Additional swallowing. So this one actually used Vital Stim itself because there are other products out there. Um, was beneficial. And then the last one um, was because there's still emerging research with SEMG and swallowing therapy. So uh, this one was about using the SEMG biofeedback and adjunct with normal swallowing exercises <clears throat> did show improvements um, with these stroke patients. All positive things. Head and neck cancer. So this one, sorry, uh, combined NMES with traditional rehab, suffering dysphagia. Um, one thing I thought that was interesting in that study was they actually also um, showed that patients' fibrosis improved as well, um, was which something they weren't really measuring, but uh, patients were reporting less of that fibrotic tissue after using the NMES. Um, Alzheimer's, which I thought was interesting because you would think about feedback might be kind of tricky with somebody who's not cognitively impaired or is cognitively impaired. Um, the biofeedback actually improves their, uh, their dysphagia in a lot of the clinical practice. So <clears throat> that's positive. I don't get a ton of Alzheimer's patients with dysphagia in my practice, but I thought that was interesting, especially since the incidence is 80%. Although most of those people are probably in. Um, and then MS showed swallowing improvement after only three weeks of NMES. Again, okay, pretty cool. Da -da -da, take away what you guys learned. So definitely still growing evidence that NMES, growing evidence in general, but that NMES plus traditional dysphagia therapy um, more effective than traditional exercises alone. They acknowledge limitations the quality of evidence, but I mean, it makes sense that adding uh, some sort of you know, additional device to them and stimulating muscles can speed things up, make things better, make the patient more aware of it. Um, so everything showed positive results. So yay, and then yes. Thank you. <laughs> I should have a quick one. So I went like two years ago to get certified, and when I was there, they were actually like in the process of doing research to see if NMES just passively 
and they were trying to say like that that was more effective than traditional um, like swallowing therapy. Did you see anything like that when you were coming across it? I did. I saw. Uh, I have to pull. I don't know if it's one of the studies I have later on, but I feel like I definitely saw a study about it. In... Do you think it seems like reliable? No. Yeah. No. That's why I was thinking. I was like, oh. but I mean, either way, it would be more effective to do the yes. traditional I think... swallow as well. Yeah. I mean, they'll slap just they'll, they'll do the vital stim, just sit there with it on, vital stim, traditional therapy, mm -hmm. and then. I mean, that makes sense. Like yeah, it's yeah. gonna be. I mean, they come in and they eat with it on because mm -hmm. the best exercise for swallowing is a good they swallow. So mm -hmm. if you just sit it on them, then. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I can, <laughs> I can I see where you're coming from. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I feel like no. I want to see if you came across that. I did, and I'll know. find it. I'll yeah. give it to you. Okay. I don't know if it tells me. Amy or Elizabeth, do you have any questions? Oh, hi, Amy and Liz. Amy is vital sim plus certified. Liz is not yet, but she's going to be. All right. Well, thank you guys for coming. Um, oh, excellent. Uh, make sure you fill out your evaluation form and the, uh, the thought-provoking questions. Give them back to me, and I give you a certificate. All right. See you. Yeah. And if you're online, email me for a quiz. <laughs> <laughs>